What did he say? What did you say? Amen. But our real enemy is not each other. Our real enemy is not 
about our fellow churches that way. Right. Our real enemy is the devil himself. Yeah. And the devil hates what's going on this week. You know why? Because he knows what's going on in here would fix the problems in his hands. That's exactly right. There's a whole lot wrong now in the world, but there ain't nothing wrong with what's going on in here. This is right. This is the only thing that will fix the, the woes and the ails of this country. It's not his fault, man, from the AC. But isn't God good? God's coming down a little bit day by day. And tonight he's seen a good rain all day and just cooled it down. Praise the Lord God. The devil may fire, he may have some power, but he don't have all of us. Thank God I'm glad for the stronger man, aren't you? Yeah. The devil is a strong man, but I'm glad for the stronger yeah. man. Yeah. They were trying to detour the preacher today. They're on 485. You know, the devil knows that he started at the top. It's like a domino effect. He just right. worked his way down. Right. And I'm glad for that unseen hand. Amen. Goodness and mercy was following you. Yes. Amen. And then God sent an angel unaware, a man behind him, in a pickup truck, to push him out a little bit. God knows what he's doing. God bless the Lord tonight. It's been good to be here tonight. It's been good to be here all week. I appreciate everybody that's been here. Appreciate you being faithful. And I appreciate all your kindness uh, from gift baskets and gift cards and uh, whatever else. Dr. Dr. Pepper, peanut M&M's, and M's and popcorn. Praise God. That basket about got all gone Monday because we had a preacher that didn't get to meet me. We didn't eat till Tuesday. That basket's about all gone. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But I thank you for every act of kindness, your prayers, your support to the meeting. And uh, that's the purpose of having a meeting. If rather or not any other church is coming up. As a pastor, when I, the Lord weighs on my heart to schedule a meeting. I settle in my heart who the man for the hour is. I mean, doors are open. Now, it's different now. You can't sit out in an absence like you used to because of all that's going on. But whether or not anybody else comes or not, I want our people to get revived. Amen. I want me to get revived. Praise God. I appreciate you being here each and every night. Some of you have been here every night this week. And I'm grateful for that. And I'm thankful. We're living in different days, aren't we? I mean, we're living in days of like any time I can remember in my 53 years, soon be 54 years in a couple of months. I never remember any time like this in my lifetime. I asked my 88 year old mom a couple of weeks ago, did she remember anything? And she said, well, it may happen, but it's, I promise you, yeah. so young, I don't remember. I don't know that anybody's ever faced times like this. Right. And that's why you need to pray for God's men. Because we're doing the best we can. Hey, man, you think it's easy? Y'all jump up here and look at what we have to look at every week. That's exactly right. Hey, man, you say, I wouldn't say that. That's why God called me and he called you. Hey, man, that's exactly right. You think this is easy, but no man gets right every mother of mine. Well, let's do this if God didn't call me to do it. Because everybody's an expert except the one that God called to do it. Hey, man. That man come to me a couple weeks ago and started going just down on this. And I stopped him. I said, I'll ask you a question. How many churches have you ever pastored? Got real quiet on the other end of the phone. Yeah. I said, how many sermons have you ever studied and hear preached by the pulpit? Got, got, got even quieter. I said, isn't it amazing that the ones God never called no more about it than the ones God did call? Yeah. Just shut up. Hey, man. Yeah. Hey, man. Just shut up. Don't get your prayer calls. Get your heart yeah. out.
prevail against you. And so I'm telling you tonight, as God's men, you need to support God's man in your church. You need to pray for him. Hold his arms up. Because we're all going through this together. We've never been through it before. But by the help of God, I believe we'll come out on the other side of this thing again. Not back to normal, but back to Jesus. Amen. God, I don't want to go back to normal, do you? Man, I want to go back to something supernatural. Something where we fall in love with God. I want to. Amen. I do appreciate the privilege to be here. Preacher, I appreciate your confidence in me. I don't know why you keep asking me back. About Every time you ask me back, I'm going to come. When you don't ask me back, I'll make you up. Amen. <laughs> but there are many great men that can stand here and fill this pulpit. But I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here. I do come at your prayers for Miss Kim and I. And the Lord is doing some things in our life. We don't know the full story of it yet. Uh, but we're, we're trusting Him. And we're looking to Him. I told him that 26 years ago. When I surrendered full time to the ministry, I said, God, I'll go wherever you want me to go. I'll do whatever you want me to do. And I still need that as much tonight as I did 26 years ago. I just want to be in the spirit of his will, will not you? That's the safest place in the world. So pray for us as we, as we pray for you. Well, I came tonight, and I wanted to preach Psalm 84, verse 6. I'm not going to preach that, but I wanted to. When Bible said that passing through the valley of Baca, they dug some wells, and the rain came and filled those pools. And I want to preach on that valley of Psalm 84, verse 6, the valley of Baca. And had I preached that, I would have preached on the God of the mountain is still God in the valley. Yeah. And uh, then when the Lord didn't give me liberty for that, I thought, well, I might preach Revelation chapter number one. When the writer there, John the Beloved, said that Jesus washed us in his own blood from our sins. And he's made us kings and priests together. And I wanted to preach on, we've been loved, we've been lifted, we've been loosed. To God be the Lord. Amen. Great things he has done. Well, when we didn't get the green light on that, I thought, well, surely we can go to Mark 10 about the blind part of things. When Jesus passed by, I want to preach on, oh, pass me not, oh, gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. Let me just want this out there. That was the last time Jesus passed through Jericho. That was the last time. And Bartimaeus got cried out and got what he needed that day. He never would have gone. That's why when Jesus passes by, friend, you better not let him pass you by. You better get what you need. But I'm going to preach something tonight that I have never preached before. And I'm not trying to sound spiritual. God knows what I'm about to tell you is exactly right. I was reading my devotions a few days ago from the Old Testament, 2 Chronicles, chapter number 7. And a phrase in one verse just grabbed a hold of me. And I have not been able to get away from it for the past two days. And I'm confident this is what the Lord, on my final night here this meeting, would have me to say, have me to preach to you. So if you have your copy of God's Word, 2 Chronicles, chapter number 7. And I'm interested in verse number 10. And we all know what verse number 14 has to say. And we all know that that application still applies today just as much as it did five, six thousand years ago. I say again what I said last night. I know all the Bible was not written to me, but it is all written for me. There are things in this Bible that God wrote exclusively and specifically to his people. But even when it's not written to me, I, I can still find application. Amen. Paul said in uh, 1 Corinthians 10, these things were written for our example and for our admonition. So even when something doesn't apply to me directly, I can still learn a principle from it and apply it to my life in a practical way. So I know 2 Chronicles 7 and 14 is Solomon's charge to God's people, the children of Israel, the people, uh, the, uh, the, the Jewish nation. I get that. But I do believe tonight it also applies to all of us as God's people. Amen. Because you know the book of Romans chapter number 9, 10 and 11, and we're right reminded there that now as Gentiles, we've been grafted into that line. Jesus came to resolve the Jews. 
His own received me not. But aren't you glad? Thank God. They opened the door to a bunch of lost Gentiles. Like you and like me. And now by grace through faith, we get adopted and we get accepted. And we get grafted into the heavenly vine. And now, spiritually speaking, Abraham is our spiritual father. He's the father of the faithful. So I believe St. Proverbs 7 14 applies practically to you and I tonight. If you're saved, you are a child of God. If you're saved, you're in the family tonight. You are one of God's people. And so I believe that still applies. If we would humble ourselves and pray and seek God's face and turn from our wicked ways, I have no doubt God would hear from heaven. I have no doubt God would forgive our sin and heal our land. Let me just throw this out there by way of introduction. Revival does not start at the White House. No. Revival starts at God's house. Amen. Then it goes to my house. That's right. And it goes to your house. Amen. For a long time, I thought revival was seeing sinners walking out and get saved. But that's not revival. That's evangelism. Evangelism is a product of revival. You get God's people right with God. And we'll go to work and we'll go to school and we'll go to our neighborhood and we'll sow the sin. You know why people don't share their faith no more? They're vaccinated. They're not right with God. You're ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because the gospel is life and life exposes darkness. And you don't have to beg people to tell people about Jesus when they're living right with God and walking with God. That's what revival does. It gets us back where we need to be. And as a result of that, sinners get saved and walk to God. But it starts with God's people. But that's not my message tonight. My message is found in verse number 10. There's a phrase there that really grabbed me, and I'm going, with the help of the Lord, I jotted down just a few thoughts in the margin of my Bible tonight that I want to share with you and, and took it from my heart. Look at that Chronicles chapter 7 and verse number 10. And on the three and twentieth day of the seventh month, he sent the people away into their tents, glad and merry in heart for the goodness that the Lord had shown unto David and to Solomon and to Israel, his people. There's a phrase in the middle part of that verse. He sent the people away into their tents. In other words, he sent them home. It's time now to go home. The temple has been built. It's been dedicated. Church is over. Now it's time to go home. And with the Lord being my helper tonight, I will preach on this thought in the form of a question. How will you go home? How will you go home? This meeting, that part of this meeting is just about over. And you're going to leave here tonight in some shape, fashion, or form, one way or another. I pray you'll leave closer to God than you were when you came on Monday night. But all of us are going to go home in a little while. How? Will you go home? Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you for the week. We thank the Lord for what you said in our needy hearts. But God, we need you one more time tonight, Lord, to feed us heavenly man. God, I pray tonight for a few minutes that, Lord, you would clear my mind and give me clarity of thought and simplicity of speech. God, I pray tonight, Lord, that you drive back every force of opposition anything that the devil might try to do to come against this time together tonight in the pages of your word i pray god tonight is your people that lord that you would challenge us i pray that you would change us i pray that you would convict us and i pray lord you not leave let us leave the same way that we came i pray you save that sinner tonight that is near as hell. God, we encourage that one tonight that's pain, that's heavy hearted, burning down with care. God, most of all, I pray that Jesus will be glorified. God, we magnify your word above your name for a little while. I pray, God, we'll leave here different than we were when we came, when we go home. In Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake. And all God's people say, it. Amen. amen. And amen. I wrote about a fellow a number of years ago. He was riding a motorcycle.
was riding through town and he saw a little boy out in his front yard. No more asking him, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm going to go down and I'm going to go sell this motorcycle. Well, the fellow in the yard was a Christian man. And so he looked at this rough rider. He said, well, what you ought to say is if it's the Lord's will, I'm going to go sell this motorcycle. Well, that old boy, he didn't want to hear about God. He got on that motorcycle and rode off into town, and he mumbled under his breath, if it's the Lord's will, well, the Lord's will or not, I'm going to town, and I'm going to sell this motorcycle. Well, about four or five hours later, that big rough rider wasn't rough anymore. He come back. I mean, he skipped from head to toe. He's got buckshot in his backside. He's bloody. He's bruised. He's battered. And he passes that old boy in the front yard, and he said, Man, what in the world happened to you? And he began to tell me. Man, as I pulled out of here, I come around the curb and hit a rock, and that motorcycle slid out from under me and skinned me from head to toe. He said, I was trying to walk to town to find uh, some help and some first aid, and walked through a guy's backyard, and got his 12 gauge shotgun out, and he filled my back end with buckshot. And he said, I finally got to town, and there was a barroom brawl that broke out. I, somehow, I got in the middle of it. I'm bloody and battered and bruised. And that boy looked at him and he said, well, where are you going now? He said, I'm going to go home if it be the Lord's will. Amen. I tell you tonight, God's will is the only thing. Amen. Every one of us in just a few minutes are going to go home. Every person in this room tonight, when there's a place that you're going to fill it up your head tonight, every one of us are going to leave and walk out of these doors and make our, uh, make our journey to our destination. We're all going home. Would you believe me tonight if I told you this? Every person that leaves and every person that goes home will have made some decision for God. You said, no, preacher, I'm not going to make a decision. Yes, you will. Your indecision is your decision. If you decide not to listen to God and not to get right with God and not to come before God, you made your decision that you're going to keep living your own life and going your own way. And do it. see, nobody gets off that easy. Every time we come to the house of God, we're making a decision one way or another. We're either going to draw closer to God or we're going to continue the same old life in the same old condition every time that we come. Every one of us are making a decision when we have go home. You remember Jesus told a story in Luke chapter 18 about two old boys who went to church one day. One man was a publican. The other man was a sinner. And they both came to church and they both went home. And they may both have came identical, but the way they left couldn't have been as different as daylight and dark. That old publican went down to his house justified and ready for heaven. But that old Pharisee went back home satisfied in his own good works, in his own good deeds, in his own good living. That publican knew that he was a sinner and dirty before God. And he wouldn't even look to heaven, but he just smote on his breast. And he said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And that old Pharisee, you know what he does, what Pharisees do? He looks down his nose at him. By the way, all the Pharisees didn't die in the first century. Their descendants are still alive today. I pastor a lot of them. Amen. You preachers are proper pastor. A lot of them too. You can identify. They look down their nose. They think they got it all together. They think that they're next in line. If there's a vacancy in the Trinity, and they think they have a right. They look at their nose down at their neighbor and say, Well, I may not be oh, what I'm supposed to be, but I'm glad I'm not like that for me. I don't do what he does. I don't know where he goes. I don't act like he acts. I don't live how he lives. And that man went home satisfied. He, he never got anything from God. He never got any hope. He never got any help. He never got any healing. He was satisfied in and of himself. They both went home, but they both went home in a different way. Every one of us tonight are going home in just a few minutes. How? The question is, will you go home? You know this text. The verses I read you many go this verse. The context of it, Solomon has done what God would not let his dad do. David wanted to build the temple. David wanted to build the house of God. 
And one day Nathan, the man of God, came down. And he called David, go and do what is in your heart. And as David set out to build that house for God, that temple where God promised, I will meet you there. That's the place that the presence of God and the power of God and the person of God. I will meet you there in that holy place. And David wanted to build that place for God. But God said, no, I've got a better plan in store for you, David. But your boy, by the name of Solomon, is going to build me a house that I can't, can't conceive, that your mind cannot comprehend. And here Solomon is, back in chapter number three, he goes on top of Mount Moriah. And I got to thinking, boy, there's some good things that happen on top of Mount Moriah. It was there with Abraham. Look at that, he's on his son, on the altar, but thank God, God, provided the rail, him and all of us, and God gave him himself as a lamb. You fast forward, the temple is built on Mount Moriah, but it's just that wasn't good enough. About 2,000 years ago, there's an old man caught it.
place at Chester for a little bit. I'll take place at Springwood. I'll take place at First. I'll take place at Calvary. It ought to take place every time God's people come in. Yeah. We're not here to bring attention to ourselves. Uh, I know a lot of people, you know what bothers me? It bothers me when somebody even gets a microphone or you take a request or announcement, but somehow a, a testimony turns into a brag on me. Come on. Oh, that, that, that just rubbed me. Right? Even, I know even that. Yeah, yeah. That's what bothers me. Somebody just want attention. Just want people to know how bad they got. Everybody's got problems. Look up in here now. Amen. Everybody's got problems. But we're going for it. It ain't time to pray. It's time to preach. Amen. Everybody's got problems. Everybody's carrying burdens. Everybody's got needs. But you know what we need? There's a place called the house of God. Hey, for a little while, we need to get out of this old world and all the distractions and all the cares that are out there. Sorry, rotten you were. And if you can repent your sin, you'll be 
separated from God forever, but then he opened up the glory of heaven yeah. and he showed you something I had not seen, yeah. here had not heard. Yeah. And he took you back to the whole world of God. And he showed you a bloody, suffering Savior hanging in your place. You got saved because a kindly of preaching, somebody loved you enough to tell you what God had to say. Yeah. Somebody asked me a while back, Brother Jeremy, should we counsel? I said, I sure do. Three times a week. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Yeah. I promise you, if you'll be faithful to the house of God and that Bible's preached, you'll get what you need. Yeah. Yeah. Anything outside of that's above my pay grade. He didn't call me to be a life coach. He didn't call me to be a motivator. He didn't call me to be a counselor. He didn't call me to be a babysitter. He offered somebody to help me tonight. He didn't call me to be a referee. He called me to preach the word. Be interested in season, out of season, approved, prepared, correct, with all the lumps of the righteousness. But our job tonight is to hear what God has to say. I want to come to the house of God. I want to hear what God has to say. I heard what everybody else has to say. I want to hear what God has to say. And there was thrilling praise. There was timely preaching. But then there was an availing prayer. Look at it, chapter 6. Look at verse 13. This is all the introduction, by the way. I haven't even got to the message yet. Praise God. Amen. Solomon had made a brazen scaffold of five cubits long and five cubits broad, three cubits high, and sitting in the midst of the court and upon it he stood. Here's what he did. He kneeled down upon his knees before all the congregation of Israel. And he spread forth his hands toward heaven. Jump down to verse 18. This is the, toward the end of his prayer. He's praying but with God. In very deep well with me and all the earth, the whole heaven and the heavens of heaven cannot contain thee. How much less this house which I have built. Have respect therefore to the prayer of thy servant and the supplication, O Lord thy God, to hearken unto the cry and the prayer which thy servant had prayed before thee. Oh, when they got uh, to the temple, the house of God, there was a time of thrilling praise. There was time to preach it, but all service wouldn't be complete if it wasn't prevailing prayer. And God's people standing in the gap for somebody. That's what intercession means. To intercede means you go before God on the behalf of somebody else. I'm glad somebody prayed for me. I'm glad they had me on their mind. I'm glad, thank God, they prayed me out of hell and prayed me into heaven. Thank God they prayed protection and provision on me. I said recently, all Wednesday night crowd, there are those that don't come on Wednesday night, but they ought to be especially thankful for those that do come on Wednesday night because those that do come on Wednesday night are probably the only reason those that don't come on Wednesday night are still above ground and breathing. Somebody help me right here. Oh, there's something about when God's people get on their feet before God. And say, God, I can't, but I know you can. God, would you save my husband? Would you save my son? God, would you rescue that rebellious kid? God, would you fix that problem at work? God, I'm throwing all my nets out, Lord. I'm giving all. Help me, Jesus, and grab a hold of the horns of that altar. And not turn loose until he blesses you. And not turn loose until he gets and it shall be given unto you. Seek and ye shall find. Not that it shall be open. And to give them sick of fire. And to give them doctor. Thank God. It shall be over. Amen. Aren't you glad that somebody gets between you and God? Right. You know, I'll be honest with you, but there have been times I've been so lonely. There have been times I didn't even want one to be a word to pray. And then number two, feel like it was going to be higher than 77 inches of my life. 77 inches. I feel it's going by the top of my head about as high as it's going. But I'm a thankful somebody to get through to God yeah. for me. Yes, sir. Times I didn't even think, Lord, you don't even hear it. I said, God, do you even know? God, are you even aware of what's going on? But thank God at the right time. Oh, yeah. I get a text or maybe a phone call. Somebody said, I just want you to know. The Holy Ghost laid you on my heart this morning. And I'm holding your arms up in prayer. You know what that does? It'll make you want to charge hell with a water gun, friend. That's what it'll do. It'll be it lights on fire and encourage you to go another mile, knowing that somebody's afraid of you. Oh, there was thrilling praise. There was 
time of the preaching, there was travailing prayer. Look at chapter 7, verse 1. There was tremendous power. Look at what happened. They, they praised it. They preached. They prayed. And now when Solomon and made it in the prayer, the fire came down from heaven. And it consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And the glory of the Lord filled the house. So much so the priests walked in, they couldn't even enter because of the glory of the Lord that had filled the Lord's house. Isn't that amazing? They prayed, they preached, they prayed, and then there was power. We've got it out of order. I told the preacher the other day, it, God convicted me about some things a few years ago. One thing was about communion. I don't know how to do it. We observed communion the first second, Sunday night of every month. Somebody asked me, well, Dr. Preacher, don't you think that's too often? Well, Paul said it's off. As you think this, uh, eat this bread and drink this cup. That's all. I don't think you can do it too often. Now, I know the risk that it might run, it might lose its meaning, but for you, you've got a problem if you ever get over Calvary and you ever get over what Jesus did for you. It used to bother me. You'd have a whole service, and then you'd pack on the Lord's Supper at the end, like we gotta hurry up and do it before we leave. Oh no, friend, that ought to be the entire focus of the entire. It ought to all be about Calvary. It ought to all be about the blood. It ought to all be about a sin death that was paid. And then it used to bother me, especially on Wednesday night, we call it prayer meeting, but we never pray. In fact, most of our prayer requests were more concerned about keeping saved people out of heaven than we were lost people out of heaven. And most, and most of our prayer requests, listen, my, my, my car is full of gas. I'm going home tomorrow. Y'all run me off. I believe in any way. Amen. Praise God. But isn't it amazing? Most of our prayer requests for children. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't pray people are sick. When's the last time you heard somebody weep? Because their husband, their wife, their neighbor was lost. Hanging in the balance of eternity, hell and hell. One heartbeat away from a crisis eternity. And we do everything but pray. Man, they, 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 they eat me alive. Eat me alive. And so we and I ask what we do. When I'm home, that we'll sing a couple of songs. We'll make a few requests, but we get that all and we pray. What are you praying for, preacher? We're praying for St. Chronicles 7, verse 1, that the glory of the Lord would fill the house. And that God would show up and show out and show off. And that God would just manifest himself and make himself known. Why? That's the only time that things are different when Jesus passes by. All you've done is God didn't show up. you just gone through the motions and you've gone home. And you came in 11 o'clock sharp. You left at 12 o'clock. No, why? Because he never passed by. Oh, but when he passes by, and the glory of the Lord fills the house. There's power. Oh, there's resurrection power. There's soul saving power. There's burden lifting power. There's soul winning power. It's all the power of God when He shows up and helps us. Before we might be. But we try to manufacture it up, don't we? Maybe if we got back to praising, we got back to preaching, we got back to praying, maybe the glory of the Lord filled the house again. We would see God do in five seconds what we could do in five years. Right. We're trying to do our human ability in our own human strength, in our own flesh, human talent. We're doing less than we've ever done. We've got more than we've ever had. I'm talking about the church. We've got more tonight than we've ever had in human biblical history. But though we've got more than we've ever had, we're doing less than we've ever had. We've got social media. We've got thank God. Thank God for that. I'm not going to lie. I thank God for the gospel's going around wherever it goes. I thank God for that. But these early church, they didn't have that. But you know what they did have? They had the power of God. They turned their world upside down. I'll say they turned it right side up for the glory of God. Why? Because God's power rested upon them to the point they told them, we don't want to hear the name of Jesus anymore. Peter and John said, well, all we can tell you what we've seen and what we've heard. You can throw us in prison. But we're going to have church. Right. Amen. Well, about three of you believe that. Yeah. You can throw us in jail. We're going to come to the house of 
But we've had it so good so long that the least little bit of persecution, we think, in the end of the world. Because we've had it so good for so long. We don't have a clue what persecution is. But it's going to get worse. God, help us make it. It doesn't matter how much worse it gets. I will be faithful. Amen. They went home a faithful people. Number two, they went home a joyful people. You see? They went home glad and married. These good and bad as well. <laughs> they know what I've been around too long. I'm telling you, friend, you take a look and you take a survey and a glance of the faces in the average Baptist church, and they ain't no way in the world they can convince the world that they got something to be happy Glad and married in heart. They went home that way, rejoicing. I've seen them come in sad. I've seen them come in mad. I've seen them leave even mad. Every once in a while you'll see somebody get glad. Because they've been in the presence of God. They went home with faithful people. They went home with joyful people. That was eight years ago. I passed through South Carolina. This is year right before the old one. But one Sunday night, they had broke loose. There was a fellow there. He was a Presbyterian. And he lived a few miles away. But he always come on Sunday night. His church didn't have Sunday night, night services. He didn't like our style of worship. Personally, he wasn't really engaged. But he just came to it. It was excitement that brought him back. He told me one time, he said, I don't necessarily believe what you're preaching, but I believe you believe it. So that's why I come back. We're talking about it. got on. I mean, there was Sunday night. And he told me that next week. He said, Preacher, I'm convinced. I looked around and I see people singing with smiles on their faces, shouting and rejoicing. He said, I'm convinced they don't know the depravity of their heart. Or they couldn't be that happy. And I told him, I said, has it ever dawned on you? It's because they know the depravity of their heart. It's because they know where they got found them and where he lives. It's because they know. Thank you. 
he will not answer. In fact, when the trouble comes, he says, I'll have that. And I believe I was for that moment. That Saturday morning, I knew I was lost. I didn't want to go to heaven. And all I could remember, Brother Nolan, and I don't even know, I guess it was from a recent service I had been in, maybe the pastor preached or who was ever preached, but all I could remember, Brother Jeremy, there was an old aluminum chair in the little house that we lived in there uh, off campus, and, and like the folding chairs in the fellowship hall, and there was a little aluminum chair set up there, and I crawled, had a bed crawl over across the floor, and I grabbed the hold of the back of that aluminum chair, and this was all I could pray. This was all I could remember, what Peter prayed when he was singing. He cried out, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. Lord, save me. That's all I could remember. And I said it over and over. And I got to about the fourth or the fifth time, and something stopped me. I didn't know then, but now I know it was the Holy Ghost. And he said, boy, he heard you the first time you called upon the name of the Lord. For whosoever's a call upon the name of the Lord, child, let me say, Lord, save me. And tonight I'm thankful that I don't have to die off from the hell, but I'm saved. I've been justified.
said, somebody carried me to a little shack that I lived in there. He said, I didn't know if my wife would still be there or not. He said, but I walked up the old wooden steps and onto the porch there. I knocked on the door. There didn't know if anybody was there. And he said, what I didn't know is that while I was serving time in jail and I met Jesus, that same preacher that came every Saturday morning, he knocked on my house one day and talked to my wife and told her about Jesus. And she went to church one Sunday. And while I was sitting in a jail cell, my wife said, the church building, and on Sunday morning, she opened her heart to Jesus. And God saved me. And he said, when I walked through the door, and she saw me, he said, her eyes were dead. He said, I hollered her name, and I said, baby, you may not believe what I'm about to tell you, but I'm not the same man that I was. Amen. And I went in a few years ago. She looked at him and called his name and said, Well, you may not believe this either, but I'm not the same wife you had a few years ago. And that broke open and they embraced each other. God, they put a home back together. He said, But we were so poor, he said, I couldn't keep the job cold enough, drink it, and my lifestyle. He said, we had a little station wagon, and all of our belongings was in that big long station wagon. He said, it was so old and so rusty, he said, do it with full board to put the rest of that in. And everything we had was in the, piled up in the back of that. What little else we had was in that little shack. He said, I was riding down the road one day. He said, no devil got in there. He said, well, if you're saved, why are you living like you? Your God's so good, why are you, why are you living like a cop or like somebody? He said, for a little while, I listened to him. But then I was reminded of where, what God, he was worth and sick It didn't matter what it looked like on the outside. As far as Jesus was concerned, I'd been made it sick and into the left. I was a child of the He said, riding down the road, he's telling all this. About ready to sing before I get up and preach that night. He said, I'm riding down the road one day. And the, these words came through his mind. He gave them all paper. James Easter. He gave them these words. As the world looks upon me, as I suffer along, they say I am not wealthy, but they are so wrong. In my heart,
I'm still amazed that God would want to call you somebody like that. I remember the first time I did it. Man, it was awful. I still got my mother. I mean, son, it was I, You know what I did? After several years after I preached my first sermon, I went back to the place I preached it. And those that were still living, I apologized to them. <laughs> and then I thanked them. Amen. Thanked them for putting up with that mess. It was awful. And then I remember the first time I got to preach out, and when I was done, they handed me a check. I thought, brother, if y'all get paid to do this, hallelujah. Man, I've done it for nothing. Amen. Yeah. I just want to serve God. Yeah. Yes. I'm still amazed tonight that God will be that good and as good as He's been to all of us. Yeah. Don't ever get old. That one day you got under. Yeah. Yeah. And He said it again. Yeah. Don't ever get old. Amen. That one day you got under. Yes, amen. Yeah. Yes, amen. Yeah. Yes, amen. Yeah. Yes, amen. Yeah. 